All right, to kick things off, let's have a look at the Master System port of Sonic the Hedgehog since it has less unused content overall. Now, for those of you that don't know, the Master System version of the game was basically a loose, scaled-down version of the Genesis game with 8-bit graphics instead of 16, different stages, and some other various differences. Now, if only there was a YouTube series that compared two versions of a game. Okay, as usual, let's first listen in on some unused music and sounds. In the game's files, there exists an unused version of the Marvel Zone music from the Genesis version. And seeing as how the Marble Zone isn't in the Master System version, this song strongly suggests that Marble Zone was at some point planned to be in this version, but was removed either due to time or hardware limitations. Next up are several short sound clips that were cut from the game. No one really seems to know where these were meant to be or why they were cut, but there are a few different theories. First up is what sounds to be like an unused version of the bumper sound. Then there's this weird scrapped echoing sound. And no one really knows what it could be used for, but it sounds maybe like a sound for entering a special stage or something. And next is an unused bubbling sound. This sounds like either water being drained or water rising in a stage, believed to also have been used in the Marble Zone. And lastly is a sound clip that sounds like some sort of alarm. This is believed to have been initially used in the Scrap Brain or Sky Base Zones. And lastly, for the Master System port, let's have a look at some of the graphics that were left unused or changed in the final version. First off, here are several minor graphics that were left out. These include random unused tile sprites, a spring, some sort of door, as well as an unused ground segment. Additionally, there are these unused labyrinth pillars which don't even have an equivalent in the Genesis version, as well as an unused animation for Neutron, found in the game's Green Hill tile set. There also appears to be an enemy that was scrapped from the final game. This bat brain enemy does appear in the Genesis version of the game, and although it can be found in the 8-bit ports files among other Green Hill Zone objects, it is never actually seen. Okay, time to move on to the original Sonic the Hedgehog version that most people know on the Sega Genesis. Keeping on the same topic as before, now we'll explore some unused sprites in this version. First up, let's have a look at some scrapped Sonic sprites. First is a sprite of Sonic gulping for air, as well as an animation of Sonic holding his breath. The latter was likely intended to be used when Sonic was about to drown. Next up are some unused sprites of Sonic jumping seen in early development screenshots. This was intended to be used as an animation for Sonic after completing a level. Now to me it kind of sort of looks like how Mario jumps, so that might have had something to do with why it was removed initially. But interestingly enough, a slightly altered version of this jump has made its way into Sonic Mania, with the same included purpose. Similarly, there is this scrap sliding animation that was cut from the original Sonic the Hedgehog, but it too has found its way into Sonic Mania. Next up are some cut spin dash looking sprites that appear elongated in a certain direction. Apparently there is a call for these sprites in the game's files, but they still go unused in the final game. Lastly, there are two unused death sprites for Sonic. The first unused death sprite is a grey burnt out sprite of Sonic that was likely going to be used when Sonic would die when touching lava in the Marble Zone. The second is a set of shrinking sprites that looks like Sonic falling. It is believed that this was going to be used in a sort of bird's eye view segment, maybe if Sonic was meant to fall from the sky or fall into a hole or something. Next let's have a look at a few unused monitors in the game. I still don't know how busting open a computer monitor can give Sonic rings or a shield, but I guess that's just video game logic. Anyways, the first unused monitor is one with Robotnik's, or uh, Eggman's face. Now as some of you know, these do appear in later Sonic games and they do hurt Sonic if open, so their purpose in the first game would have likely been the same. Next is a monitor with a set of goggles. This unused power-up was likely going to give Sonic either more or unlimited time underwater, which would have been awesome because if there's one thing I hate about Sonic games, it's the underwater levels. Clash. Next is a monitor with static, which is believed to have been a sort of exception handler for a monitor containing invalid objects. Now these monitors can be placed in a level with debug mode, which we will get to later. But if placed and broken, nothing really happens. And the last unused monitor is one with just an S on it. 
Although unused in the original game, this monitor does make an appearance in the 2013 remakes, in which it turns Sonic into Super Sonic. Next, there exists an unused sign meant to be in the Springyard Zone, which just reads, Let's Go! There is also an unused enemy in the Genesis version named Splats the Bunny. And seeing as how even after the release of the game, a trading card and a figurine of Splats were made, it is very likely that he was cut really close to the end of the game's development. There are several other, more minor unused graphics not really worth mentioning, but I'll quickly just flash them on screen for you right here. They range from several unused tile sets to unused explosions and switches. In the game's files, an unused warping effect can also be found. When attempting to use it in the game, when Sonic runs into the warp area, he will disappear and a warp noise will play along with this effect. And then Sonic will reappear a few seconds later. It is believed to have been an early version of warping to the special stage, or simply just a way of testing it. Okay, now it's time to get to the fun stuff. There are actually three really short codes that you can enter in on the title screen. For the first one, by pressing C six times followed by up, down, left, right on the title screen, then after pressing start while holding A, B, and C on the demo screen, instead of the Sonic Team logo, a secret list of the game's developers can be seen written in Japanese. Next, a little bit more useful, if you enter up, down, left, right, then A plus start, you can then access the stage select menu which lets you start at any area you want, even the special stage and final zone. And finally, the most rad code of this game, by entering up C, down C, left C, right C, and A and start, you can now enter debug mode. In this debug mode, you can move Sonic and the game's camera pretty much freely, even through walls and floors. Additionally, you can cycle through various objects that appear in the level and place them wherever you see fit, basically turning the game into Sonic Maker. This was actually a ton of fun to play around with, so if you have a copy of this game, I highly recommend checking this out, as it can even lead to some pretty, uh, interesting outcomes. Or you can beat an entire level in like 15 seconds and feel super proud of yourself. Anyways, I thought we'd use this debug mode in each level and see if we can discover something cool. First up is the most iconic Sonic stage, the Green Hill Zone. One interesting thing I was able to see was that if you try to move the camera below this section here, we can actually see that these spikes aren't attached to the ground. Normally because the camera is so high, we assume that the spikes would be on something. So it's kind of weird to see it this way, along with these moving platforms. This actually happens quite often where spikes or lava are placed over nothing. Sure you can call it lazy, but I guess we weren't really meant to see this far below. Also, close to the first boss fight against Robotnik, far below the stage, there is a floating rock that was left over by the developers. You can even stand on it for a few seconds until the main camera tries to move back to where it should be, which kills you. Ever wanted to create an army of motobugs? Hell, now you can. Another weird thing about using debug mode is that when you're in certain areas, usually towards the end of a level, sprites such as the end post or other enemies won't load properly and instead other sprites will be called. This leads to weird looking end posts as well as bizarre enemy mutations using robotic sprites. Uh... Okay. Having troubles with the special stages? Not anymore you're not. As if the special stages weren't trippy enough, you can use the debug mode to take Sonic outside of the map, and then some really strange stuff starts to happen. Sonic will fall and accelerate really quickly, and then randomly various sprites of the special stages will appear. Now what's really neat about this is that it actually reveals several other sprites that are unseen normally. This includes a marker labeling which zone the special stage was for, a 1-up icon, as well as a W marker with an unknown purpose. Sometimes I seriously wonder what kind of LSD Sonic Team was on in order to come up with this special stage aesthetic. Next up is Marble Zone. Here we can spawn random fireballs and yup, even entire fire geysers and lava flows. Logic. On that same note, in this section that you normally have to run away from the lava, behind what the camera can normally see, we can notice that the lava stream chasing you does get cut off as well, instead of actually filling up that entire area. I also found these weird robotic tiles that are only visible in debug mode, but I can't seem to figure out what they represent or why they're here. In the Marble Zone boss fight, I'm pretty sure I actually broke the game for a while, and I spawned so many enemies that Dr. Robotnik himself was culled out. In probably my favorite Sonic 1 zone, the Springyard Zone, debug mode lets you spawn bumpers wherever you want, which as you can imagine can lead to some problems. 
In this zone, we can also move the camera way below the stage to see more of the background image and even underneath it when it gets cut off, which I thought was pretty neat. Seriously, what the... Like I said earlier, I really don't like Sonic Water levels, and thankfully Debug Mode helps me a lot with this. In Labyrinth Zone, we can start to spawn a lot more objects and enemies like these heads that fire projectiles, a bunch of random floating spears, or even the bubbles that refill your air. I was also able to skip one of the most annoying boss fights ever, so that's pretty sweet too. Starlight Zone didn't really have anything too noteworthy that I could find, so let's move right along to Scrap Rain Zone. In this zone, you can actually place those robotic tiles that I mentioned before, and it looks like all that they are are invisible blocks to stand on. However, to me this still doesn't make much sense as they can be found inside walls and such, but my guess is that they were just a last minute measure by the developers to add collision detection to objects quickly. And just like in Labyrinth Zone, thankfully we can also skip basically all of Scrap Rain Zone's water segments in Stage 3, which brings us right up to the final zone. During this fight with Robotnik, again the debug mode gives the player an unfair advantage. Although you can't play Sonic on the top of the area, you can move the camera and see where Robotnik will pop up next before you're normally supposed to. It's also interesting to see that Robotnik will stay in the same spot until right before he teleports to another area. Additionally, right after being hit when moving off screen, Dr. Robotnik is still stuck in his damaged phase and is surrounded by a white rectangle that doesn't change until he teleports. And with that, Dr. Robotnik is defeated, or at least until the next game. Twenty twenty was a pretty crummy year for most. Thankfully, though, it ended off on a high note for many Sonic fans. For those that didn't hear, the cutting room floor as well as Hidden Palace presented a newly shared prototype of the original Sonic the Hedgehog. Why was this such a big deal? Well, although some prototypes of the game have been known to exist, until this day, none have been properly dissected, let alone made public. So naturally, when it was being live streamed, many fans, myself included, were losing their minds. Anyways, in this video we'll be diving into this prototype and talking about what I think are the most notable changes from the final as well as all the interesting finds. Anyways, enough talk, we got lots to go through here, so let's take it back to a time before the game that started it all and find some lost bits. So like I mentioned earlier, there are several known different pre-release builds of Sonic 1 out there, and although it appears that this build lacks specific info like a build date, just based on things seen in this prototype, it's believed to be a later build placed somewhere between the demo scene at CES of 1991 and the build scene in Game Player's Sega Genesis Strategy Guide magazine. And if you're wondering, apparently this build we're discussing here originates from an unnamed magazine from the United Kingdom. Anyways, let's get to the changes. Before we get to the gameplay, just after booting up the game, already a few changes can be seen here when compared to the final release. Here a much smaller, shinier, and more silent SEGA logo starts off the game. So unfortunately no SEGA to be heard here fellas. There's no Sonic Team Presents preceding the iconic title screen either, and this prototype contains a message to press the start button, one which doesn't appear in the final. And a bit of a fun fact about this one, apparently this text is supposed to actually appear in the final release, but due to an error stemming from the Sonic Team Presents and Press Start Button text using the same memory space, the latter just doesn't get displayed as intended. But enough title screen, now let's get to the gameplay as well as the stages. First, some general changes seen here throughout this prototype. For starters, some differences can be noted with the heads-up display. Here, rings is just seen as a singular ring. It also won't flash red when the ring count is zero. And the timer here loops back to the nine minute mark every minute after reaching it, which also means that this build doesn't have a 10 minute time limit before you lose a life. So you're free to roam around and explore the stages to your heart's content with no time constraint. Furthermore, another weird difference here is that the timer will keep counting up after getting a game over. In the final release, it stops instead. Next up, there are a slew of other gameplay differences in this build. Sonic has no collision above him when damaged, there's no combo points bonus for getting a multi-kill, this game lacks any sort of checkpoints at all, 1-ups are earned at 50 and 100 rings instead of 100 and 200 respectively, making it much easier to stock up on lives. To add to that, you can also take damage and reach 50 and 100 rings as much as you can to keep earning lives within a stage, whereas in the final release, the game limits you to only two ring-based 1-ups per life per level. 
This change was very likely made as the developers saw that building up a stockpile of lives was a bit too easy, potentially removing the fear of losing a life. Collision is a bit scuffed at times, some platforms seem to cause Sonic to lose speed for no good reason, spikes hurt Sonic even with the invincibility power-up, the vertical camera movement is quite slow, often too slow to keep up with the blue blur, Sonic's jump here is shorter by a whopping 6 pixels, and there are some more changes which I'll touch on as we go through the stages seen in this prototype. And speaking of stages, let's get to them. First up, of course, is the most iconic and reused Sonic area, Green Hill Zone. Which, despite being the most polished zone seen in this build, it still has several differences compared to the final release. Stuff like the Sunflower still having magenta centers instead of green. Some enemies were removed, like this Motobug at the start here, which was likely removed so that players wouldn't lose a life mere seconds after starting. Several palm trees here lack things like item monitors or springs, which were later added. And yeah, just in general, there are some layout changes in the individual acts. Like there's this wall of spikes along the wall here near at the start of Act 1 for seemingly no good reason. Like there's nothing really back there behind them or anything, so what are they really protecting? Come on now, spikes. Thankfully, these were removed. Another notable change is seen here at the highest part of Act 1, where platforms haven't been added in yet. Act 2 had much of the same, some added or removed rings and springs, items in the monitors were changed, and some platforms were added here and there. It's again similar in Act 3, where once more, some monitors were changed, and some more spikes were removed. The boss fight here remains unchanged, but I just thought it notable to mention that at this point in development, this was the only zone to feature a functioning boss battle. Now, all those things are fine and all, but probably the most notable thing here seen in Green Hill Zone, though, are these balls. When looking back at my old Sonic Lost Bits video, I'm surprised I didn't really cover this ball. But before being seen in this prototype, although it's found left over unused in the final release, it's unable to be placed in, rendering it useless. So this ball's intended placement and use were only seen in some old grainy screenshots from other pre-release builds. That changes here, as the ball appears in each act of Green Hill Zone. It works kinda as you'd expect it to, only a bit more buggy. Sonic can push them around, as well as be pushed by them. It also seems to just leave the area when reaching certain spots, like this bridge here. It's not entirely clear what their purpose was meant to be, I mean, besides just being an obstacle. Like, man, some of them are in some really inconvenient places. It's no surprise they were removed. Since Sonic can actually roll these balls through the S-Tunnels, it's possible they might have served some larger purpose, but that's still currently, unfortunately, unknown. And another thing before we move on are some differences seen when completing an act. First off, Sonic can't run off-screen after completing an act, which is fine, I guess. But one of the most interesting changes in this build, at least I think, is that here Sonic can perform a unique victory jump on this screen. Now, I mentioned these sprites in my original Sonic Lost Bits video, since they went on to remain unused in the final release. So it's really cool to see them in action here. And honestly, jumpy boy Sonic is pretty cool. I wish they had kept this. Furthermore, for the end of the act area, the hidden point markers aren't yet present in this build, and the special stage rings aren't fully implemented. Instead here, if Sonic runs through one of these rings, he will become sparkly and then warp off screen in a way reminiscent to that seen later in Sonic CD. Now I've seen some fans speculate that this might have been a remnant from a time travel mechanic similar to CDs that could have been intended at some point, but I think it's far more likely that this just might have been a scrapped transition between the act and the special stage, especially given how close to release this prototype was. A big mechanic like time travel seems like not a trivial thing to scrap this far into development. Now on to Marble Zone. Oh my god, it's the UFOs! UFOs, you might be wondering. Well, no one knows for sure what they are, resulting in the unidentified part of the acronym, but again, up until this prototype dropped, these were only seen in some early screenshots of the game, and they became somewhat of a well-known change since their removal is so obvious. As such, many fans were really happy to see them in a working build. They don't do anything besides act cool in the background, but hey, the truth really was out there. Other than that though, we got more of what you'd expect in terms of changes such as different layouts and enemy and ring placements. Once again, Act 1 in Marble Zone has a badnik right at the start which can bop Sonic if you don't move in time. 
Anyways, in the interest of time, for the rest of this video, I'll stop mentioning all the ring and enemy placement changes, as I'll just highlight more major changes on the full level layouts. One more notable change in Act 1 is the difference seen in this here hallway. Instead of the vertical spike thing falling, a horizontal one is seen in this prototype instead. Now what makes this quite interesting is that this horizontal spike thing actually goes completely unused in the final, outside of being accessible via the debug mode. So just like the ball, it's really cool to see another object that's never been seen in a used state. Moving on to Act 2, as seen here, the layout was quite different in the latter half of the act. Additionally, another rather big change here deals with these glass platform things. Instead of just hitting a switch to move them, Sonic has to jump on them several times in order to very slowly lower them. This is kind of similar to that one mechanic with the barrels seen in Carnival Night Zone in Sonic 3. I'm very glad the change was made here. In Act 2, you can also damage boost through the lava here to glitch out of the stage for no reason at all, so that's fun. Then Act 3 has more of the same in terms of changes, and once again, more major layout changes can be seen here towards the end of the act. And like I mentioned, Green Hill Zone was the only one here with a working boss fight, so instead at the end of this zone we are just greeted with a signpost, and with that ends this last fully complete zone in this prototype. Next up, Springyard Zone! Yep, here not only do we get to see the early name for Springyard Zone, but also a completely different backdrop graphic. Gone are the mountains, distant city skyline, and trees, and instead this zone appears to have been intended to be found smack dab right in the middle of a city, as we can easily see billboards or signs in the background. These include many wishing you good luck, telling you to go go, and ones that I sure can't read. Starting with Act 1, the layout is generally pretty similar, with a few changes here and there. Keeping with the prototype being more difficult theme we've been seeing so far, this build has this bumper surrounded by four lines of spike balls. Definitely an obstacle, that's for sure. Alright, now on to Act 2. Or not? Guess we're skipping Labyrinth Zone 2 and going right to Starlight Zone. Okay, I suppose? Right off the bat here, it becomes apparent that this stage isn't exactly something you'd call finished, as it turns out this is actually the last normally playable act in the game, as after you touch the end sign post, which is misplaced might I add, the game will take you back to the title screen. Fear not though, there is a way to access the rest of the stages which we'll come back to later. Anyway, Starlight Zone here has a bit of a different style as the platforms aren't just rigid blocks, but rather many more trusses are present. So just like the prototype itself, the stage used to have a more under-construction aesthetic. The layout also has several changes which can be seen throughout the act. Honestly, apart from a few key areas like the loops, this stage is quite different. And there are also several areas that don't really have an obvious way of being reached at this point. So like I said, normally, I guess for whoever this build was made for, this would have been the end of their demo experience. But thankfully this prototype has a not-so-hidden level select that can be simply brought up by pressing A and Start on the title screen. And here we can access the rest of the stages in this prototype, which are left out for good reason, as they aren't nearly as finished as the rest. So let's first quickly finish up with the zones we already started on. For the rest of Sparkling Zone, it's more or less the same as what we saw with Act 1. Leo changes like starting on a slope rather than a flat platform at the start of Act 2, as well as some removed half-pipe things. By the time we get to Act 3, although the level's layout is more or less complete, at this point in development there are no objects in the stage, like the bumpers or, you know, the floating platforms that are necessary to complete the stage. Yeah, without them, this act is normally impossible to complete, but it's not like there's a signpost at the end anyways, so not that big of a deal. Before moving on, I think it's also of note that there's this weird thing in this prototype here where Sonic will, like, stick to the top of some ceilings here when jumping into them. I don't believe this is a thing in the final game. Anyways, now on to the rest of Starlight Zone, and just like with Sparkling Zone Act 3, these two are almost completely object-free. Several changes were also made, of course. Here in Act 2, this wavy segment didn't exist, there was one less loop here, and yeah, I'm starting to see way more changes than similarities. And the same goes for Act 3, where some ideas, like the steep intro slope, was kept, but basically the rest of the stage got a complete overhaul, not much was kept the same. 
And this overhaul was certainly for the better, as at this stage in development, this act is really tough to get through. Next up, since it was skipped earlier, is probably my least enjoyed zone in this game, Labyrinth Zone. Just never really enjoyed most water levels in video games, you know? Which is why I was very pleased to see that at this point in development, water wasn't yet implemented. Yay! And just like the other normally unplayable stages, this entire zone is once again pretty barren. Additionally, you might have already noticed that the background in this zone is also different, as instead of the bricks and such, here we see a bunch of rocks as well as some cracks where sunlight can be seen peeping through, really hammering in the fact that this zone is in some sort of cave. The weird thing is, although the background looks fine in Act 1, in Act 2 it's only half present, and finally in Act 3 it's completely gone. Pretty strange. Other changes include different designs for the crystals seen in the zone, which here look more simplistic, as well as these brick wall tiles, which were removed in the final release for whatever reason. The layouts of course also saw some changes, but not nearly as many as some of the other zones, as for the most part, the general layouts appear pretty similar. That said, without the water being implemented yet, these stages are pretty much impossible to normally complete. Thankfully though, the debug mode seen in pretty much every main series Genesis Sonic game is also present here, so with it I can zip through and around walls to my heart's content to explore some otherwise inaccessible areas here. Also, just like with the debug mode in other Sonic games, with it in this prototype we can also place in various objects including items and enemies. Like here we can place in rings which appear black due to a glitched color palette or a crab meat badnik. What? What do you mean you can't tell that's a crab meat? And yeah, before we move on, the debug mode here didn't really reveal anything else notable that we haven't already seen in this prototype or in the final game. Just the ability to zip around, have invincibility, and to place in objects, stuff we've seen countless times here on the show. Now back to the level select, the last main zone left is Clockwork Zone, or Clock Orc Zone, I guess? Seems like someone forgot to add the W here. Turns out actually there's no W here because there is no W sprite present amongst the title card graphics due to storage limitations. Anyways, Clock Work Zone is an early name for what became Scrap Brain Zone, and this is probably the least finished zone in this prototype. Not entirely surprising considering it's the last regular zone in the final game. Much like the other zones, right away it's obvious that the background graphic is different. Instead of the smoggy industrial background, here it appears that the backdrop just uses tiles from the stage itself, often making depth perception an extra challenge. And in Act 2, the backdrop is just a nice blue screen of depth blue. Awesome. Like I said, this zone is very incomplete. No items or enemies, the fast travel tube things don't work, in fact the paths are often really scuffed. There are several dead ends, the gears and conveyor belts don't quite work as intended, and yeah, overall the stage just looks as polished as sandpaper. As such, it's unsurprising that both acts were almost completely revamped in the final game, with very few layout ideas remaining. Both acts? Well, what about Scrap Brain Zone Act 3, you might be wondering? Well, it just doesn't exist in this prototype, at least not in any playable form. You can't even access it while on the level select screen. Act 3 here just isn't accessible. And if you haven't noticed on the level select screen, there's also no final zone present in this build yet either, so that's about it for the zones. But of course, there's also the special stage to check out. There's only one special stage found in this build, and it's pretty simple in terms of layout, with very few rings and bumpers. There's also no Chaos Emeralds to collect yet, and instead there's just this green block surrounded by rings, which I guess is supposed to be a placeholder for the emerald. It unfortunately can't be obtained or anything though. Also, there's no real end to the special stage either, even if you manage to reach the goal tiles. The stage will spin around, but then it will just stop for a while, and then the stage will reset. Not much else you can really do here at this stage in development, but I guess they were just showing this off as a sort of proof of concept. And although that's it for the levels, we're not quite done just yet, as this prototype also contains several things which go normally unused here. First, let's start off with some unused audio, which can be heard in the sound test in the level select screen. Now to clarify, these might not necessarily be unused in the final release, but they do go unused in this prototype. First, the sound effects. These range from buzzers, to vibrating sounds, to footsteps. 
in the interest of time, I'll just zip on through the sound effects here. Then, as far as music goes, there aren't any unique, unused tracks in the prototype, but a few sound a bit different compared to the final, and also go unused here. The final zone and continue screen tracks don't go used here since both weren't implemented yet, and the ending theme is slightly slower compared to the final. Here's a quick comparison. Next, although currently just speculation, there's also an unused level color palette that's believed to have been meant for Green Hill Zone, and this is what the stage looks like with it. Some believe that this might have been for some sort of once planned night mode version of the stage, but again, it's currently just being speculated. Now last up for this video, let's go over some unused graphics and objects. As far as unused sprites go, we got some sparkles, some fireball things, this sprite speculated to have been meant for the sparkling zone boss fight, these water splashes meant for labyrinth zone, some puffs of smoke, these magnet and skull graphics meant for the special stage which are believed to have given Sonic the ability to attract rings and die in the mode respectively, and lastly there's an unused sixth sprite for the animation of the UFOs seen in Marble Zone which makes the rotation of the outer ring seem more complete. Now this can actually be restored into the game with the use of a cheat code, but why this one frame doesn't go used here isn't clear. Then for unused objects, first there's this, whatever this is, that cycles between two garbled sprites. This unknown object can actually be briefly seen in footage of early development of the game on a developer's screen. Then we also have this object that acts as a door that can be opened by stepping on a switch, this thing that's believed to have been a switch meant for Marble Zone, another unknown unused object meant for Labyrinth Zone, as well as this seesaw object that's placeable in Starlight Zone via debug mode. Now these do go used in the final version, but here in this prototype, even when placed in, they lack the spike balls that are used to throw Sonic upwards. And even more mysterious is that here these seesaws also have an unused function that allows them to disappear. This prototype also contains several badniks that weren't implemented in any of the stages seen. We got the Burrowbots in a different color palette, the Jaws Badniks, Splats the famous scrapped badnik who also went on to be an unused enemy in the final version can be placed in Marble Zone again in a different palette. Oh yeah, and they also don't seem to have collision with moving platforms, and yeah, that's kind of weird. And finally, and probably most interestingly, is the Ball Hog Badnik, who here is seen functioning differently. Now in the final cut, the Ball Hogs face sideways and will launch a bouncing bomb towards the player. In this prototype, however, the Ball Hogs function is instead to waddle side to side and shoot bombs directly downwards towards the player from a higher platform. This function has been a topic of speculation for a while, since this version of the Ball Hog could be seen in some pre-release gameplay footage. So once again, it's really cool to see this in action here. It's really awesome to finally have basically the holy grail of Sonic prototypes publicly available. Sure, it would have been more cool to see a build from an even earlier point in development, but I'm certainly not complaining. This truly is an amazing find, and it's awesome to have this for preservation. And like I've been saying throughout the video, although we've seen a lot of these early changes in old screenshots, it's really cool to finally see them in action. Before the release of the Game Gear version of Sonic 2, magazines and other media outlets were given a special prototype of the game for review purposes. This prototype is simply known as the Sonic the Hedgehog 2 Auto Demo, and as the name implies, this prototype was actually not playable, and was more like just a video demonstration of the game's features. Interestingly, Tails is nowhere to be found in this demo, suggesting that during the December 1991 build date of this prototype, Tails might have not even been planned to play a major role in the game yet. Outside of the usual small differences seen between the prototype and final releases, this auto demo also has some unused content found in its files. First up is a music track that can be heard in each of the zones featured in this prototype, 
Oddly, there is no music track even similar to this one in the final release. The auto demo prototype also contains several sprites that were unused in this build. The weirdest ones are just these creepy, unused sprites of Sonic laughing. Something about them just seems so... unnatural. Here are most of the other unused graphics that are found in the prototype's files, but are never normally seen. Alright, and now it's time to get to the version of Sonic 2 that probably most of us remember better, the version for the Sega Genesis or Mega Drive. This version of Sonic 2 had a few pre-release prototypes that contained several things that were altered or unfortunately left out of the final build. To better understand all the changes, we must first lay out the timeline for all of these prototypes. The earliest build that we know of so far is known as the Nick Arcade prototype, due to its similarities with a build shown in the Nickelodeon Nick Arcade game show in 1992. This is such an early prototype that it still used several assets from the first Sonic the Hedgehog game. The next prototype was discovered on a Chinese GeoCity site and is known as the Simon Y prototype, named after the person who discovered it. This is another early build, although it is more complete compared to the Nick Arcade version. Apparently the Simon Y prototype was from a demo cart that had been stolen from a toy show in New York in 1992. And lastly, there are the prototypes simply numbered betas 4 through 8, which were all internal testing builds of the game very late into its development the last two weeks before release to be specific. So let's begin with the earliest build, the Nick Arcade Prototype. This is the only iteration of Sonic 2 to have a mechanic in which Sonic would rebound off of a wall if he should run into one with enough speed. These are the sprites that were used for this mechanic for Sonic falling after the rebound. Gotta go slower Sonic, gotta go slower. But boy, let me tell ya, this mechanic is super annoying in a game which is meant to be played fast. It's not often that I'm glad some things are removed from a game, but this is definitely one of those times. The Nick Arcade prototype also contains several graphics that are unused in this build as well as any other. The first of these is an animation of Sonic turning left and right. It seems the developers wanted Sonic to have an animation when turning instead of just instantly changing which way he is facing. This build also has unused sprites for Sonic running at a faster speed, as well as what looks like him running at some sort of maximum speed. Sonic appears to lean further forward the faster that he runs. Furthermore, there are unused sprites that would be used for an animation for Sonic pulling on something. Probably a handle or box. Next is an unused animation of Sonic balancing on a ledge. And here are some more miscellaneous objects with varying purposes. This last spinning metal ball looks the most interesting, and it was meant to act as an obstacle that would continuously bounce on a floor. It was eventually accessible in the debug menu in the 2013 remake of the game. Now let's get to some of the unused badniks in this prototype that never made it into the final release. First up is the badnik named Bubbler's Mother. As the name implies, these were intended to fly around and drop bubbler enemies. Next up is B-Bat, a bat badnik that was also scrapped from the final release of Sonic 2. In a similar scrapped manner, there are also the Stegos or Stegways, Gators, and B-Fish badniks. All of these badniks, except for the B-Fish, were later reintroduced in the 2013 remake of the game. And moving on to the unused graphics in the Simon Y prototype, most of them are the same as the ones in the Nick Arcade build with a few exceptions. These exceptions are some animated drills for Metropolis Zone, some vines for Mystic Cave Zone, and most interestingly, some leftover graphics from another Sega game, Cheeky Cheeky Boys. Cheeky Breaky. Apparently it was common practice to reuse the chips to test prototypes, and they were often not completely erased. As a result, any data that wasn't overwritten would retain data from whatever was previously loaded. As such, these graphics for this fire and splashing from Cheeky Cheeky Boys made its way into this Sonic 2 prototype. Wild! There are also some unused monitors that appear in the Nick Arcade and Simon Y prototypes. The most interesting ones are the Mystery Monitor and the Spring Monitor. In the Nick Arcade prototype, the Mystery Monitor does absolutely nothing. But in the Simon Y prototype, it will change Sonic's color palette to that of Supersonic. 
However, although the colors may have changed, no additional supersonic abilities are given. The spring monitor has no effect in either prototype, but there are two common theories as to what they might have done. The first theory is that it would give Sonic or Tails a pogo spring that would bounce them up and down until they take damage, similar to that scene in Sonic Triple Trouble. And the other theory is that it would simply just increase Sonic or Tails' jump height in order to reach higher up areas. Moving on to betas 4 through 8, we can see many things that were altered closer to the release of the game. For instance, the main title screen underwent several iterations until it became the one we saw in the final release. This title screen was used up until Beta 5 when it was changed. What's weird is that the artwork of this original title screen actually appears in the instruction manual for the non-Japanese versions of the game, as well as in the Master System and Game Gear versions. Several other more minor changes were made in these beta versions such as the screen positioning, the level select screen, some text graphics, and the color palettes used in the special stages. Here is a comparison of the special stage color palettes used in the Beta 4, with those used in Beta 6 and onward. You might also notice that in the older betas, the name Miles is still used. This was changed in the later betas to the nickname Tails. Other notable graphics that were changed between the beta builds include the sparkles from the invincibility power-up, and also the stegos who got a bit of a design update with better looking head plates, flames, and tires. Now that we've discussed all of the prototype builds, let's have a look at how some of the animations and graphics have changed between the builds. The blinking sprites for Sonic in the Nick Arcade and Simon Y builds make it look like Sonic doesn't have eyelids when he closes his eyes. I mean it looks fine, but it's kind of weird when you start to think about it. In Beta 4 and onwards, Sonic was given proper eyelids matching the color of the rest of his skin. Interestingly, Sonic's walking animation was actually better in the early prototypes compared to the later builds and final release. In the Simon and Nick builds, the animation had 12 frames, compared to the later ones which only had 8 frames. My best guess is that this was reduced in order to save on memory usage and improve overall performance of the game. One pretty well known change between earlier builds and the later ones is Sonic's running animation. In the earlier builds, Sonic's legs and shoes go into a blur, kind of like you'd see in a cartoon. This spinning whirl was removed in the later prototypes to look like what we saw in the final release. Another animation that changed quite a bit is that of Sonic skidding to a stop. Originally, Sonic would skid and start leaning in the opposite direction, but in later builds he just skids and instantly turns around. And a bit of a fun fact, the beginning of the earlier used animation was eventually reused in Sonic Mania. Lastly for Sonic is his balancing animation which was also altered. In the earlier prototypes, it was a lot more similar to the balancing animation from Sonic 1. In the Beta 4 build and onward, it was pretty much completely redone. Another pretty big change was made for the Crawl Badniks. Their sprite was essentially remade and they were given a walking animation as well as the ability to put up their shield in more than one direction. Lastly, the end goal signposts also underwent some changes between the builds. Here you can see the changes between the first Nick Arcade build and the Simon Y build and beyond. Moving along to some of the more well-known parts of these prototypes, now let's talk about all of the zones in these builds that aren't normally playable and have to be accessed via the level select cheat. At the prototype stage in the development of this game as seen in the stage select screen, some of the prototypes still used the zone names and music from Sonic 1. In fact, Green Hill Zone from Sonic 1 can actually be played in the game. And I use the term play loosely as this stage has some pretty messed up collision and glitched out graphics. Honestly, without using debug mode, this level is basically unplayable. I mean... What? Although this act never made it into the final release of Sonic 2, there were still some alterations between the Simon Y and later prototypes. This supports the notion that Green Hill Zone might have been slated to make a return in Sonic 2. And next up are the prototypes of Chemical Plant Zone which are still listed in the game as Marble Zone. This stage underwent some pretty big changes, even between prototypes, most notably between the Nick Arcade and Simon Y builds. The most obvious visual change is the color of the background palette which was changed from purple to a more yellowish green color. 
and the actual level itself was almost completely redone. There are way too many small changes to show individually, but I'll overlay the layouts of each iteration here and you can see all of the differences for yourself. Another notable change after the Simon Y build is that the loop segments were altered and their diagonal corners were removed. Now let's move on to one of the most famous unused zones in Sonic history, the Hidden Palace Zone, which in the earlier build still goes under the name Springyard Zone. Although the stage is unused, it is still mostly complete, suggesting that it was removed late into the game's development, despite it being believed to be one of the first levels to be worked on. It was revealed that the Hidden Palace Zone was intended to be a level where the player would be taken upon collecting all seven of the Chaos Emeralds. The Hidden Palace Zone features several of the unused enemies I mentioned earlier, and it appears to be some sort of cavern containing remnants of an ancient civilization. There's a bit more history to the scrapped zone, but I think I'll go over it in more detail in a future video. Other oddities here are that the water doesn't affect Tails at all, as it doesn't slow his movement and he can't drown. Also, if a second controller is plugged in, the water level in the first act can be controlled by pressing up or down, probably as a debugging feature. The Hidden Palace Zone is actually accessible in the final release, but just like with the Green Hill Zone in the Nick Arcade prototype, the collision of the zone is completely goofed up. This scrapped zone was later re-added into the game in its 2013 mobile re-release as an optional zone accessible for Mystic Cave Zone Act 2. The Hidden Palace Zone name was also eventually reused for a zone in Sonic & Knuckles, and although the zone looks pretty different, it is believed that this version was based on the scrapped zone from Sonic 2. What do you get if you cross Chemical Plant Tiles, Labyrinth's Rippling, and Marble Zone's Ring Layouts? You get this unplayable mess. It's obvious to see that this Labyrinth Zone is broken and essentially unplayable. Under Starlight Zone, we can access an earlier version of Emerald Hill Zone, aka Green Hill Zone 2. This is the only zone that is playable in the prototypes without the use of the level select cheat. Just like with Chemical Plant Zone, Emerald Hill Zone also underwent some pretty significant layout changes between prototypes. Again, I'll show off a few of the differences between the versions here. Up next is Hilltop Zone. Since this zone is using the former Scrap Brain Zone slot, there are still several oddities here. This is fine. Again, there were several changes made between prototypes. And oftentimes, the changes made after the Nick Arcade version would fix some pretty big errors. When trying to load Scrap Rain Zone Act 3, the graphics are a bit goofed. And last up in the Nick Arcade prototype is the final zone, which just loads up Hilltop Zone Act 1 again. Going left will result in falling into a dead end pit, and if you go right, you better like the color purple because that's all you'll see after the game crashes. Now there are methods of getting past the area that always crashes the game, but there's nothing really else to see in this act that's noteworthy. Moving on to more of the Simon Y prototype zones, since this build was further into the game's development, here we can see earlier versions of the zones that made it into the final game, as well as some more unused zones. But first, let's talk about Zone ID 1, which is an empty stage slot that can be accessed in the Simon Y build via a cheating device. Lovely, isn't it? It is believed that this stage is the same broken mess as the Labyrinth Zone from the Nick Arcade build, but this time with Emerald Hills palettes. Similar cases can be seen again in Zone ID 3, Zone ID 6, Zone ID 9, Genocide City Zone, and Death Egg Zone. Although each with a different color palette or lack thereof. Wait, did he say Genocide City Zone? Yep, apparently according to one of the game's developers, this scrapped zone was intended to be a mechanical themed Act 3 of Metropolis Zone that would itself appear as a standalone zone with only one act. The genocide term was apparently chosen due to the language barrier faced by the development team. The genocide part of the zone was obviously altered due to the nature of the word, and it was changed to Cyber City after the Simon Y build. An interesting note about the Genocide City Zone is that the theme of this zone was used to create the graphics for another unreleased game called B-Bomb. These unused graphics were then later reused again in the third level in Sonic Spinball, The Machine. Like I mentioned earlier, several of the zones that would make it into the final game have early versions in the Simon Y build that also had some changes in future prototype builds. 
Some of these changes were pretty significant, like the ones in Casino Night Zone, where originally the stages looked pretty unfinished. Here I'll just quickly show a few more examples of the changes in Casino Night Zone, and other levels including Oil Ocean Zone, Aquatic Ruin Zone, which was originally named Neo Green Hill Zone, and Mystic Cave Zone, which was mistakenly listed as Dust Hill Zone. Dust Hill Zone is another pretty famous zone that was scrapped from Sonic 2, and as the name implies, it was to be a desert-themed stage. Soon after Sonic 2 was first announced, Sega distributed three concept screenshots of the game, mixing assets from Sonic 1 and 2. These screenshots were of Emerald Hill Zone, Hidden Palace Zone, and a desert stage which was eventually identified to be a mock-up of Dust Hill Zone by developer Hirokazu Yasuhara. To this day, no actual playable form of this zone has ever been found, and only some remnants of it are believed to be found in other prototypes and the final release. It is speculated that Dust Hill Zone would serve as inspiration for Desert Dazzle, an area intended for the 2011 remake of Sonic CD, which itself was also scrapped from the game. Both Dust Hill Zone and Desert Dazzle are believed to be big inspirations for the Mirage Saloon Zone, which did finally make its way into Sonic Mania. Alright, next up is Wood Zone, yet another zone that didn't make it into the final release. This stage is pretty small, and as you can see, it's definitely nowhere close to being finished. The zone is pretty buggy, and if you aren't using debug mode, much of it is inaccessible. Only the palette and music data from Wood Zone made their way into the final release of Sonic 2, and they can still be loaded into the game's Emerald Hill Zone. Since the playable prototype version in the Simon Y build still used the Metropolis Zone music, it was originally speculated that Wood Zone was a sort of past version of Metropolis Zone. It was later revealed that it was actually supposed to be a present version of Casino Night Zone instead. Yep, that's right, Sonic 2 was originally planned to have a time travel aspect. I'm assuming something similar to what was used in Sonic CD. I hope you aren't sick of levels that were scrapped from this game yet, because there's a few more to talk about. The rest of these aren't found in the prototypes or final release, and were only revealed in developer notes and interviews. As far as anyone knows, none of these made it past the design stage of development. Several of these unused zones can be seen in these early development sketches that Hirokazu Yasuhara showed off at a game industry event in Poland in 2017. Rockworld Zone is speculated to have also been part of the game's intended time travel mechanic, and would have been a past version of Dust Hill Zone. Winter Zone was apparently just going to be a winter reskin of Dust Hill Zone, in which the zone would be covered in snow and Christmas trees would replace the cacti. Again, maybe intended as a future form of Dust Hill Zone or something? And next we can see Olympus. Due to the Greek origin of the word, it is believed that it was the original name for Aquatic Ruin Zone, which also features Greek-style ruins throughout the level. In these development sketches, we can also see a Sand Shower Zone, Ocean Wind Zone, Blue Lake Zone, and Tropical Plant Zone. Not much information is really known about these zones, and whether they are just development names for zones that were changed, or entirely new zones that were never really worked upon, is still a mystery. So as you probably know, just like with the original Sonic the Hedgehog game, Sonic 2 was also released in two, or I guess two and a half, different versions. As such, to kick things off, let's have a look at the Master System and Game Gear versions first. Just like the prequel, these versions of the game are similar to the Genesis version, but with a lower resolution, some different zones, as well as some more differences here and there. First up, I just want to address a mistake that I made in my previous video in which I played the wrong, unused song. The song which I played, I claimed was unused in the prototypes, but it was actually not in the prototypes and it is found in the final release in which it goes unused. So if you didn't hear it in the last video, here is just a small snippet of that song. As typical, no one knows for sure where the song was supposed to have been used, but because of their similarity, it is believed that it may have been used as an early theme for the Crystal Egg Zone. And for completion's sake, here is the prototype song that I was supposed to play for you guys in the last video. <laughs> 
while this song is used in the prototypes, nothing like it is heard in the final cut. Next up we have several unused sprites and level tiles. Although most of the assets in the Game Gear version of the game were taken right from the Master System one, some Sonic sprites were altered. One example of this is the bored Sonic animation seen when remaining idle for a while which was altered in the Game Gear version, leaving these sprites to go ultimately unused. Similarly, there is also an unused Sonic Death sprite that was used in the first Sonic the Hedgehog game. There is also a cut animation of Tails crying and then being happy. It is extremely likely that this was just supposed to be used at the end of the game when Tails is rescued, but for whatever reason, this was cut. Next we have two unused full body sprites of some bosses. Normally, only the head of these underground zone and sky high zone bosses can be seen, but the entire sprites of both of them are actually found in the game's files. I honestly think it would have been at least a little bit more amusing to see the sky high zone boss walk around like this instead. Akin to most classic Sonic games, this game too has some monitors that go unused. First, there is an unused arrow monitor. This would have most likely been used to give the player a checkpoint, just like it did in the prequel to this game. Next are unused monitors with a question mark and a grey sneaker. The question mark monitor is believed to function similarly to the one in the two player mode in the Genesis version of the game, which basically just grants the player a random monitor effect. The grey sneaker on the other hand is believed to have slowed the player down similarly to the speed down sneakers in Sonic 3's two player mode. And you guys know how much I love going slow in a Sonic game. Kind of like that one time they wanted to add a mechanic to Sonic 2 on the Genesis in which Sonic would bonk off a wall if he runs too fast into it. Ah yes, good times. The last unused monitor looks to have an image of Sonic doing what he does best, being a fast blue boy. Although normally unobtainable, this monitor can actually be found obscured in a wall in the Crystal Egg Zone. But just like other Sonic monitors, this one defaults to just giving the player an extra life. And as I mentioned earlier, there are also several unused level tiles left over in the game's files. These are admittedly not as interesting, so I'll quickly just show you some of them here. Now it's time to move on to the Genesis or Mega Drive version of Sonic 2, which at least to me is the one that I always think about when someone mentions Sonic 2. So again, let's first have a look at some of the unused music left out from this game. The first of these is track number 10 in the game's Sound Test. So yes, it is accessible in the game, but it is unused in normal play. Let's have a listen. This track was in fact supposed to be the one used for the Hidden Palace Zone, a fairly complete zone that was found in earlier prototypes of Sonic 2, but ultimately scrapped from the final release. This song however wasn't found in earlier prototypes where the playable versions of Hidden Palace Zone instead used the track that was later repurposed for use in the Mystic Cave Zone in the two player mode. But the fact that the Hidden Palace Zone is still playable in the sound test just reinforces the notion that the level was probably scrapped pretty late into the game's development. The other unused track isn't left over in the game's files, but rather on the official soundtrack album of Sonic the Hedgehog 1 and 2, composed by Masato Nakamura. Track number 37 on the second disc of the set has a song referred to as STH2, unused song, Masa's demo version. This is another version of the Hidden Palace Zone song, but instead of being a looping track, this one transitions to a more proper ending. Some fans believe that this might mean that the unused Hidden Palace Zone song was also planned to have this transition to a more finite ending, perhaps in a cutscene or something. This would make sense as Hidden Palace Zone was intended to be accessible towards the end of the game after collecting all 7 Chaos Emeralds throughout the game's adventure. So maybe it would have served as an alternate ending of sorts as well. <laughs> 
Interestingly, when the Hidden Palace Zone was re-added in the 2013 remake of the game, neither of these tracks were used, and instead the original two-player Mystic Cave Zone track was chosen instead. In Sonic 2 Sound Test, we can also access several sounds that can't be heard in normal play, and many of them are also unused leftovers from Sonic 1. Let me just quickly go through all of them here. Now, onto some more unused graphics. First up is a grayscale death frame for Sonic, probably intended to have been used if Sonic died from the result of coming into contact with some considerably hot lava. If you've seen my Lost Bits video on Sonic 1, you might also recognize this sprite from that game as well, in which it also goes unused. Apparently it was also unused in Sonic 3 and Sonic and & Knuckles, so you can look forward to me talking about this sprite at least two more times in those videos as well. Next is an unused animation of Sonic grabbing onto something traveling pretty fast. Aside from being vertical instead of horizontal, this is very similar to the animation used in the Wing Fortress Zone when Sonic is holding on to the panels on the side of the ship. Although it's updated and upside down, a similar animation can be seen in Sonic Mania. And next up is a normally unused animation of a laughing Dr. Robotnik sign. The game is coded to use this animation when Sonic loses rings during the Silver Sonic fight in Death Egg Zone. The only problem is, the Death Egg Zone doesn't have any rings, so in turn Sonic never loses rings in this fight and as such, this animation goes unused. This animation can however be used in the 2013 remake of the game when Sonic dies, as well as in the Sonic Jam and 3DS ports if played in the Easy and Ring Keeper mode respectively. It can also be seen in the original game simply by giving Sonic some rings via debug mode. And while on the topic of Dr. Eggman, er, I mean Dr. Robotnik, the game also contains an unused animation for the fight with him at the end of Chemical Plant Zone. This animation would be of the Doc accidentally dropping some of that dank blue goop on himself. Of course, this makes his beady little eyes grow ten times as big... for some reason. This animation actually has been hiding in the game's files all the way since the Nick Arcade prototype. Next are some unused animals, a walking turtle as well as Picky the Pig who was seen in Sonic 1. On the Badnik side, there are a few unused frames of Aquas spitting out some oil, and of Valkyrie with its landing gear. There are also several unused variants of the Bubble Snake seen in Chemical Plant Zone. The variants range from being one bubble in length, all the way up to 16. In the final game however, every single encounter with these guys only uses 6 bubbles, leaving the other 15 variants completely unused. Another remnant of the Hidden Palace Zone is an unused icon of the zone meant to be seen in the game's level select screen. With the use of a cheat code, this graphic can be still loaded into the game. Yet more proof that this level was probably ready for release, but was scrapped pretty late in development. For the stages, other unused graphics include some light objects for a chemical plant zone, a spring holder for the also unused ball launcher for oil ocean zone, and a turbine fire laser thing meant for wing fortress zone. There is also this weird unused platform that can be accessed with the game's debug mode in Mystic Cave Zone. As you can see, this platform is made of rings. They can't be collected and Sonic can walk on this platform like any other one. Pretty odd. Next is an unused spinning pull stage hazard for Wing Fortress Zone. It is still coded to hurt Sonic, but it can be destroyed as well. The static monitor that we can often see in Sonic Debug modes also makes another unused return. This time however, if breaking open the monitor, the player will actually take damage. The game also has unused graphics of a door in Aquatic Ruin Zone that would have closed behind the player after passing it, and a sideways pressure stopper from Oil Ocean Zone. In the final release, only the vertical pressure stopper is ever encountered. There is also an unused score tally variant that would have been seen at the end of a zone that only has one act. Instead of saying Sonic got through act 1, 2, or 3, it would have said Sonic got through zone, which makes sense. However, in the final game, all of the zones with only one act completely forego a score tally at the end of the stage. That being said, this can still be seen in these stages if an animal capsule is placed in the stage with the game's debug mode. <laughs> 
Sonic 2 also has a ton of unused level chunks from previous prototype builds left over in the game. Like way too many to show all of them, so I'll quickly just show a few of them here as an example. And now it's finally time to talk about Sonic 2's debug mode. Just like in the other 2D Sonic games that I've already covered, this game too contains a debug mode which allows us to play several objects, and more importantly, it allows us to move pretty much wherever we want, even where we aren't normally supposed to. And as you'd come to expect from the other Sonic games I've covered, this can lead to some normally unseen things. Before we get to that stuff though, there are actually two more debugging features in Sonic 2 that I haven't seen in the other Sonic games that I've covered thus far. The first of these is another thing I forgot to mention in the prototype video, and it's dubbed as Night Mode. It can be accessed with Debug Mode enabled, and by holding C and pressing Start on the level select screen in the Simon Y prototype of Sonic 2. Pretty much all that this Night Mode does is it places a dark overlay on certain sprite layers. This was most likely just used by the developers to check if sprites were being placed in the correct layer. The other new debugging feature is in the final release, and this one allows us control to move a few things by pressing up or down with the second controller plugged in. For instance, the background cloud layer can be moved up or down in the wing fortress zone. Fun! More interestingly, both the rising ground and lava can be actually controlled towards the end of the hilltop zone acts. These are now much less of a threat than they normally are. Another interesting thing that I found here is that the ground and lava actually loop back to the bottom of the level after they reach the top. Why this is, I'm not too sure, but I don't think this would have been visible in normal circumstances. Okay, anyways, back to moving around to see some more normally unseen stuff. As many of you may know, the development of Sonic 2 was pretty rushed, and this can definitely be seen, or rather unseen, just outside of what we can normally see when playing the game. Oftentimes, normally inaccessible rings can be found in several stages. These are mostly the result of just simply being left over from the earlier prototypes where the stage layouts were different. Because these rings are unobtainable normally, this makes getting a perfect score, which requires getting all of the rings in a stage, impossible. And it's not just unobtainable rings that are left over in areas from previous builds either. There are also leftover enemies like the Seesaw in Hilltop Zone, and this misplaced air bubble in Aquatic Ruin Zone. We can also see these debug question marks here in Metropolis Zone. These are normally seen in areas with lava, so perhaps at one point there was lava here as well. With debug mode as usual, we can also stray from the normal path and see some areas that seem unfinished. I mean, it makes sense, because the developers knew, like, 99% of players would never find their way down to these places. Also, some things that you can place with debug mode tend to glitch out if you try placing them in an area where their normal sprites aren't normally loaded in yet. Such as this animal capsule, a thing of nightmares. Another neat thing debug mode lets us use in Sonic 2 is easier access to the teleport monitor. This monitor is normally used in the game's two-player competition mode and will cause Sonic and Tails to swap places. This makes sense in two-player mode, but in the normal game, not so much. One crazy thing that I came across with this was in the Death Egg Zone. Since you only play as either Sonic or Tails in the stage, the game doesn't really know what to do when the monitor is broken, and it tries to throw you as far right as possible. Thankfully, with debug mode, we can stop on the way, and this lets us walk through the entire level with ease. As you can see, the graphics didn't load properly in the background here, and... Seriously, what the hell am I even looking at? I'm guessing similar to the capsule graphics I mentioned earlier, if we get to this area before we are normally supposed to, the normal Death Egg robot sprites aren't loaded properly yet, and as such, we are greeted with Glitch Lad over here. The debug mode in Sonic proves yet again to just be a gift that keeps on giving. And for the last stop of this video, I just want to go over some of the remnants of the zones that were scrapped from the game, which can still be accessed. First up is Unused Zone ID 1, which is an empty level slot which was believed to originally contain Labyrinth Zone in an earlier prototype. 
This stage is essentially just an empty, objectless version of Emerald Hill Zone Act 1. What's odd is that for some reason, even though we are playing as Sonic, the name Miles and his picture are used in the lives counter instead. In a similar fashion, next up are the remnants of Wood Zone, a famous zone that was scrapped from the game. Again, this is an objectless Act 1 of Emerald Hill Zone, but now with Wood Zone's palette, messed up collision, and Metropolis Zone's music. Again, for whatever reason, the lives counter is changed, but this time the Tails nickname is used instead. Next is unused zone ID3, which is almost identical to the first one, but here Oil Ocean music is used and the Badnik sprites from Metropolis and Emerald Hill Zone are loaded. This unused zone slot is believed to have been originally used by the unused zone known as Dust Hill Zone. And lastly, we have remnants of the Hidden Palace Zone. Unfortunately, as you can see, this hot trash is nothing like the cool unused version of the zone that can be accessed in the earlier prototypes of Sonic 2. This version does still use the proper collision from the prototypes, so it's playable. But why someone would want to look at this for more than two seconds is beyond me. Alright, so first let's get a quick timeline of all the currently known prototypes of Sonic 2. So before 2019, there were the Nick Arcade and Simon Y prototypes, as well as several internal beta builds with build dates ranging from September 18th to September 24th, 1992. Then recently, three more builds were discovered with build dates between the Simon Y and those internal beta prototypes. So let's go in chronological order and start with a prototype right after Simon Y. This prototype has a build date of August 21st, 1992, placing it about three months before the retail release of the game. Although many things remain the same from the Simon Y prototype, such as similarities in the title screen, the lava not working properly, and Tails' behavior, like making you lose rings if he gets hit. Like, what the hell, dude? That said, there are also several other notable changes here. First, and probably most importantly, is Sonic himself. His sprites have been updated from the previous build to match the one seen in the final release. Also, for some reason, when charging up a spin dash, not only does it make some weird sounds, but also after this, the rings will start making different sounds too. Next, the zone order was also changed from the Simon Y build. The order in Simon Y was Aquatic Ruin first, followed by Chemical Plant, Hilltop, and Emerald Hill at the end. But in this prototype, Aquatic Ruin and Emerald Hill swap places, and Mystic Cave and Metropolis Zones were added after Hilltop. I guess this change might have been made since Emerald Hill is very similar in style to Green Hill Zone, and perhaps the developers wanted the player to start with a zone that felt more familiar. Hell, it was still even referenced as Green Hill Zone at this point. Now, let's talk bosses. Another sizable addition to this version is that a robotic battle has been added in Hilltop as well as Dust Hill Zone, which would later become Mystic Cave Zone. In both cases, the fights aren't quite finished. In Hilltop Zone, the screen lock for the boss fight hasn't even been implemented, so you're free to come and go as you please, and the fight area is also a bit different. While the screen does lock in the Dust Hill Zone battle, the fight is also lacking the falling stalagmites that the player normally has to avoid. Moreover, in both cases, Robotnik doesn't have any sound effects present, and also neither fight has the proper boss fight music implemented. Instead, the regular stage background music just continues. Also, the capsules still haven't been implemented in this prototype yet, so the stage will just end after defeating the good old Doctor. Then, as far as stages go, there are several other changes and improvements here and there, such as fixes to broken or soft lockable areas, and adding more detailed backdrops, like here in Casino Night Zone. Other than that though, unfortunately much of the other early game mysteries, like the Hidden Palace Zone, Genocide City Zone, and Wood Zone, all appear to be unchanged from the Simon Y prototype. Seeing as this build was three months before release, I don't really think these stages would have been worked on after this build, and since it's unchanged from Simon Y, I guess the only other possible way we might find these missing levels in a playable form is from some currently undiscovered prototype dated sometime between Nick Arcade and Simon Y. <laughs> 
I suppose only time will tell if one is ever unearthed, but I certainly hope so, because I'd really like to see if there's more to these levels than what we currently know. Anyways, the last stage here to check out is the special stage, and yeah, this just happens. It appears to be the special stage from Sonic 1, but obviously not very easy on the eyes. And the last really notable thing that was first implemented in this build is none other than Super Sonic. Although not accessible in normal gameplay, you can turn into Super Sonic by spawning in a question mark monitor with the game debug feature and then breaking it. Some things to note here are it's mostly just a palace swap with faster speed, as the supersonic features aren't implemented here yet, namely invincibility. At this stage, it still doesn't drain your rings. And finally, Sonic's color changing palette doesn't really work underwater, and he will just turn back to being blue. Oh yeah, and for some reason, when playing as supersonic, I couldn't get past this area here. I went back and checked, and yeah, it's fine with regular Sonic, but for whatever reason, it was just blocking me off as Super Sonic. Weird. Now moving along to the next and second prototype that was very recently dropped, this one has a build date of September 14th, 1992, placing it less than a month since the previous one, and just nine weeks away from the final release. As you'd expect, several improvements and fixes were made in this iteration, though since it's only a few weeks since the previous one, they just aren't as numerous. Hey, you see that? Yup, it's a menu on the title screen. And this build is currently the first known one to finally feature it, while also keeping the old style background that was changed in the final version. The level select screen in this prototype still looks the same as the previous build, however this time, unfortunately the normally unused levels have all been scrubbed from the game, and are no longer accessible. And even though the hidden palace zone still appears in the level select, it too is no longer playable. Unless you call this playable, but I sure don't. Anyway, I guess this means that the decision to finally cancel these zones was made at some point between August 21st and September 14th of 1992. So again, if there is anything more to these scrap stages, it would have to be in a prototype from before this one. There are several other smaller changes here, such as different object placements in some areas such as in Wing Fortress, a lot more rings in Casino Night Zone, different behavior in the Robotnik fights, and oh yeah, the intro title cards were finally implemented in this build. And although all the stages can be played here, the last three, Sky Chase, Wing Fortress, and the Death Egg, can't normally be completed. Supersonic's functionality is also much further along in this build, as he now has invincibility. However, being supersonic still doesn't drain your ring count. The last major addition that was added in this prototype is the special stage. Right away, there are several changes we can note, such as this traffic light at the start, like something we'd see in an early Mario Kart game. Other smaller notable changes are the sonic text here is still orange, the ring counter always has three digits, there are absolutely zero sound effects here. Only one special stage is present in this game, and it uses a color palette that isn't seen in the final game, and the sprites for the rings, as well as Sonic jumping, are also different here. Oh, and if for some reason you were planning to try and beat this special stage, clear your schedule because, well, you can't. The stage just loops infinitely, as nothing really happens when the timer runs out. The only way out of this digital hedgehog purgatory is to either take your time and collect 1,000 rings, which will cause the game to crash, or, you know, you can just shut the game off. Lastly here, the two-player versus mode was finally implemented in this build, for some levels. While Emerald Hill, Hilltop, Casino Night, and Mystic Cave look fine, the other stages just don't. I mean, even the ones that look okay had some graphical glitches, and Dr. Robotnik was reduced to four blue lines. Nice. As you know, boss fights aren't a thing in the versus mode in the final game, but I guess they still were in this build. Anyway, which levels work and don't work makes sense since those that do are the ones that are playable in the versus mode in the final game. So I guess it was around this time that they chose which few stages to work on for versus mode, and it explains why the other stages just don't look right. 
That said, Hilltop Zone isn't one of the playable versus stages in the final game. So it looks like it may have been planned to be one of those versus zones at some point, and my bets are it was replaced by the special stage. And last up for this video is the prototype that was publicly dumped in early 2019 that was originally leaked by Sensor, after which the prototype has been named after. This prototype is believed to have a build date anywhere from September 15th to 17th, 1992, and was apparently originally leaked two weeks before the game's release. But apparently, people didn't care about unreleased prototypes back then. This build was supposedly first leaked with the intention of bypassing the game's copy protection measures with this intro screen. I guess so people could copy the game and spread it around. Being within only a few days between the previous build we covered and the next Beta 4, which has a build date of September 18th, I'll be honest with you, there isn't too much different in this build that I haven't already discussed either here or in my original Sonic 2 Prototypes video, but I'll quickly mention some of the highlights. For starters, the special stage now got some upgrades, such as Sonic's name being blue, as well as, you know, actually being beatable. Basically, all of the other changes are seen in the Sky Chase, Wing Fortress, and Death Egg zones, since I guess the obvious focus was on those levels at this stage in the game's development since they weren't completable before. That said, there are still several changes in the sensor prototype from the final release. The changes include things like removing some rings here and there, adding checkpoints, removing propellers, adding some cluckers, as well as fixing the Death Egg title card. Like I said, this build was really close to the next one, so it doesn't really have many changes that we haven't seen before, and I think the newly dumped September 14th prototype basically outshines this one. Regardless though, the more prototypes we have, the merrier, as we can get a better understanding of the game's timeline during its development. And that's pretty much where we're at with Sonic 2 as I'm making this video. It's a shame no crazy new discoveries were made with the likes of the Wood Zone and Genocide City Zone and such, so I'm hoping even more prototypes get unearthed soon. And I guess I'll be back with a fourth Sonic 2 Lost Bits video if and when that happens. Until then though, the fine folks at the Hidden Palace and Cutting Room Floor have also dropped a new Sonic 3 prototype, so expect a video on that soon. And as always, a huge thank you to both the Cutting Room Floor and the Hidden Palace for sharing these awesome prototypes with all of us. Anyways guys, thanks for tuning in, and I will see you in a bit.